The solar industry has been booming in recent years, and if you believe the forecasts, the coming years will be even bigger. If you look at the largest solar manufacturers in the world, virtually all of them use silicon as their active layer material, either single crystal or polycrystalline. But one company decided to go a completely different route. This is the story of cadmium telluride. To understand why silicon dominates the solar industry, we need a bit of background on how photovoltaic solar actually works. In semiconductors, electrons have certain energy ranges of states that are allowable, called bands. The lower band, called the valence band, tends to be mostly occupied with electrons, while the upper band, called the conduction band, tends to be mostly empty. The space in the middle where electrons can't occupy, is called the band gap. When light with sufficient energy hits the material, an electron can get promoted from the valence to the conduction band. We're now left with an electron that is free to move around in the conduction band, and a positively charged space in the valence band where an electron is missing, called a hole. From here, the principle behind photovoltaic solar is actually quite simple. We basically have some potential energy stored up in the electron hole pair, and if we can separate them, we can have them complete a circuit and do useful things. Power is current times voltage, and both can be easily visualized here. Current is just the number of charges moving through the wire, which is directly correlated with the number of electron hole pairs we make, and voltage is simply this potential difference. Now that the basics are out of the way, let's start to think about what makes a good solar material. In a real solar panel, there are obviously several materials, including our old friend indium-10 oxide. But the one actually absorbing light and creating these electron hole pairs is the one we're interested in. This is called the active layer. There are several things we look for in a good active layer material but one particularly important one is how wide the band gap is. For light to be absorbed, the energy needs to be greater than the band gap energy. If we make the band gap smaller, we can get more total current, but there's a big compromise in doing so. Since electrons are free to move in the conduction band, they almost instantly fall down to the edge of the band, releasing their excess energy as heat along the way. This is known as thermalization loss, and it's a big killer of solar efficiency. You can probably see the big trade-off starting to take shape now. If we have a small band gap material, we absorb more total light and generate more current, but we lose more energy to thermalization, reducing our output voltage. If we have a high band gap material, we have a higher output voltage since the absorbed electrons don't lose as much potential energy, but we miss out on absorbing a lot of the lower energy light, resulting in lower current. Since we know the distribution of light hitting Earth, it's possible to calculate the ideal band gap for a single layer solar material. In terms of electron volts, a unit of energy equivalent to moving one electron across one volt of potential, the ideal band gap is about 1.3. The same calculations can be used to find the maximum theoretical efficiency of any single junction solar panel, which comes out to around 34%. So much for those terrible crowd-funded solar projects claiming ultra-high efficiency. Of course, the real-world output will always be less than this theoretical limit due to things like voltage drops across other layers, recombination of charges before they make it to the current collector, and so on, but the principle remains relevant. To maximize efficiency, we need to find a material with a band gap close to this ideal value. Okay, we know the ideal band gap. Now what are our options? Well, the truth is that among elements or common compounds, there aren't many. Most elements that are solid at room temperature are metals. They have no band gap, and that obviously won't work. Natural compounds like metal oxides, 
generally have strong bonding and band gaps way too wide for this purpose. On the periodic table, it's pretty much only the group 4 elements like silicon and germanium that have the small band gaps we're looking for, and germanium is a bit too small. At around 1.1 EV, silicon's band gap isn't perfect, but it's fairly close, and good enough to make silicon by far the most widely used solar material. So we seem to be somewhat limited, but if we apply some solid material science principles, maybe we can find another viable solar material. When designing this new material, we can't create a new chemical element, but we can design compounds that mimic some of their interesting properties by considering the electron structure. If our goal is to make something like a group 4 element with four valence electrons, how about combining a group 3 and a group 5 element? The electrons from the constituent elements will bond, and the overall electronic structure starts to resemble something with four valence electrons per atom. These 3-5 semiconductors are really useful. Ones like gallium nitride are commonly used in LEDs. For solar, gallium arsenide is an outstanding material, with a band gap very close to the ideal value. It currently holds the world record for a single junction solar cell, and multi-junction derivatives are used in applications like space exploration, but it's just too expensive to be widely used here on Earth. Gallium is expensive by itself, and with the traditional process used to make high-quality gallium arsenide wafers, it's prohibitively expensive, around 1,000 times the price of silicon. So let's branch out a bit in our search for good solar materials. If 3 and 5 average to 4, what about taking it one step further and going to groups 2 and 6? It's a simple idea, but it actually works in some cases. 2-6 semiconductors aren't as widely used as their 3-5 brethren, but one combination turns out to be useful for our purpose. Group 2 element cadmium, and group 6 element tellurium. Put these two together, and you get a band gap of about 1.5 EV. Almost perfect for solar. Now, the band gap alone doesn't make cadmium telluride a serious alternative to silicon, but it has several other things going for it. Cadmium telluride is a direct band gap material, while silicon has an indirect band gap. In a direct band gap material, to make the jump from valence to conduction band, the electron doesn't need to change momentum. And if you're not familiar with the solid state physics behind any of this, don't worry. All it means for solar is that light absorption is much stronger. In an indirect band gap material, light might have to pass quite deep into the material before it gets absorbed. Because the transition is easier in direct band gap materials, typically light is absorbed very close to the surface. Since solar cells strive to absorb as much of the incoming light as possible, this means that a layer of cadmium telluride can be made that's just a fraction of the thickness of silicon, but with comparable absorption. Although silicon itself is an incredibly abundant element, making the high-quality, ultra-pure silicon needed for solar isn't cheap. And the amount of it required to make the thick active layer in silicon solar is a major stumbling block for the economic viability. In addition to economic advantages, cadmium telluride also loses less efficiency at higher temperatures than silicon and performs better in low-light conditions. Although the material itself has been around for decades, in the late 90s advances in thin film deposition techniques finally allowed the mass production of solar panels using this technology. In 2002, a company named First Solar launched their commercial line of cadmium telluride based panels, and from there, the story of how a previously unknown semiconductor launched a multi-billion dollar industry begins. In the beginning, First Solar's panels didn't match the efficiency of silicon ones, but they didn't need to. The cost advantages allowed them to make significant headway into the market, and their business boomed in the following years, passing numerous solar landmarks along the way. In 2009, 
They became the first solar company in the world to cross the $1 per watt threshold, a number long considered a benchmark in the solar industry. In addition to cost advantages, cadmium telluride edged out silicon in environmental impact as well, with an energy payback time calculated to be roughly half that of silicon. The same year, First Solar also became the first solar company to reach an annual production rate of 1 gigawatt, and by some metrics, it was the largest photovoltaic solar company in the world. Cadmium Telluride was leading the solar boom. So is the future of solar cadmium telluride? Well, not necessarily. First Solar deserves a ton of credit for utilizing the technology to make solar economical, but it's not without its disadvantages. Cadmium is fairly abundant, but toxic. This doesn't pose any issue while it's in the solar panel, but it's going to make recycling of cadmium telluride panels critical once they're at the end of their life cycle. Tellurium is the exact opposite, only mildly toxic, but quite rare. Right now, that's not an issue since most tellurium is produced as a byproduct from the production of other metals, but it might be a limiting factor if the demand continues to grow. But by far the biggest threat to cadmium telluride's future is simply the fact that the rest of the solar industry isn't just sitting on its hands. While First Solar's price per watt has continued to fall from that benchmark value back in 2009, and it continues to develop its technology and expand, it hasn't been able to hold on to its spot as the top solar company in the world. Advances in silicon panel manufacturing and simply the economies of scale have brought silicon solar prices down dramatically. Although there are a few other cadmium telluride companies these days, most of the largest manufacturers still use silicon. So, silicon isn't going anywhere anytime soon, and it might not be the only game in town. Other thin film solar technologies like SIGs are trying to gain market share. Improvements in gallium arsenide might make it cheaper, and there are many other materials being researched that might make an impact down the road as well. So, Decades from now, when we look back at how solar boomed, who knows what we'll see cadmium telluride as. Was it one of the main protagonists that led the charge from start to finish? Or just one of the side characters that was killed off after a minor contribution? But the truth is that it doesn't really matter, because cadmium telluride has already made its impact. Literally millions of people get their power from the sun because of it, and it helped to kickstart an era where solar was a viable large-scale technology rather than just a niche product. No matter what, the history of how solar became big will include the story of cadmium telluride. <laughs>